Welcome to week six, everyone. Have more birds for you today. First, a uh, robin uh, snacking on some uh, berries. But we, we go for more exciting fare than, than robins here. So a uh, great horned owl, uh, probably a juvenile, not one, but uh, two of them. And uh, I, it's always amazing the extent to which owls' pupils can dilate and also that their pupils sort of dilate independently sometimes. Uh, so this pair was, was very interested, but uh, as, as uh, juveniles, also important to get some nap time. So we have a, a sleepy great horned owl here uh, with a bonus uh, picture of uh, how great horned owls uh, uh, make their living catching things in those claws. All right, any questions to start us out? Did that all get your finger too? Uh, the owl did not get my finger. Uh, a knife intended for an onion got my finger um, on uh, on Monday. Was not successful in uh, stopping the, the bleeding, so got a couple stitches this morning. Um, so hopefully that'll do the trick. Uh, other questions? All right. So. Uh, this is some, some review about uh, accessing memory inside of, inside of structs. We have our normal lemming, lemming uh, uh, what's sort of polygons, um, but 3D polygons. All right, so uh, take a minute and think about which instruction would we use to implement this get lm function that gets a specific int out of the array inside the struct and Obviously, there would be a return after whatever instruction, or maybe one instruction is, is not enough. All right, please discuss with your neighbor how uh, you're thinking about these different assembly instructions. All right, I think we've had some, some movement toward B, which is indeed what, uh, what this will uh, what this will take. Yeah. So a reminder on this memory addressing operand, we have some displacement, a base register, an index register, and a scale. And we add displacement plus base register plus index times scale. That whole thing is the memory address that we then dereference, unless it's an LEA instruction, in which case we saw after the arithmetic and just copy that. Other part of this is remembering how structs uh, work, in, work in memory. So first is our character one byte. What comes after that in our, in our struct? <laughs> Do we need like empty spaces because of internal fragmentation? Because we want everything to like end on a multiple of four. Yeah, our, our ints need to be at a multiple of four so they couldn't come right after this character, that would mean they were not aligned. So then we have A, how many bytes is A total? <clears throat> yep, 16, four ints. And then we would have P as eight. And I think we'd also need, yeah. Does P start with multiple things? Yes, you are correct. You would need to start at eight, so we need four of those, and then. And based on this, we can see that getting something inside of A involves we need to go four into the struct, and then whatever index inside there, we go four into A for each index. Yeah, Jim. Do we have to add the um, four? Empty space, because doesn't that like a 20? 20 is a multiple of 4. So P, a pointer, which is 8 bytes, needs to be stored at a multiple of 8. Got it. Things are always stored at a multiple of whatever size they are. Um, so, yes, yeah, as, as Owen pointed out, in order for P to be at a multiple of 8, we need to get it to 24 rather than 20. Other questions on this?
All right. So this struct is going to take 32 bytes, right? Uh, yes. Does that mean, does it have to be on multiple 32 bytes? Does each one of these structs have to be on multiple 32 bytes? So each struct has to be on a multiple of the largest thing inside the struct so that all the interior parts align. So the structs need to be at a multiple of eight. So if this if the total size had not added up to a multiple of eight, then we'd have some external fragmentation to pad it out. Other questions? All right, let's review uh, what our stack frames look like, uh, which we talked about uh, last time on, on Friday. Uh, we're reviewing these because we're about to launch a, an assault on the stack frame to subvert, uh, subvert uh, running programs, but first we need to, to remember how this works. So uh, our stack pointer RSP, that's the top of our stack, and it may be a little hard to see, but higher addresses and are, are at the top of this, lower addresses at the, at the bottom because our stack grows down. And our stack addresses will be The stack will start at this address, this high address in memory, and it will grow down. So RSP will be uh, below this, but this is one way to recognize just by a memory address whether something is on a stack, uh, is, on, is in the stack portion of memory, because you'll see like 7FFFFF at the, at the start of the address. And then the code segment of our of memory so our stack grows down, and code starts at um, uh, address uh, 400,000 in hex, and it grows, and it goes up from there. So if we see an address that starts with 400, likely in our code segment of memory. Any questions on the, this picture of the stack? Yeah, I guess the, is the purple here to show like where a new function is called? So the, uh, good point, this purple section is the stack frame for the current function. So the current function's return address registers its saved local variables, and any arguments it's putting on the stack for some, a function it's about to call, that is this purple section, and then above is the stack frame for whoever called the current function. So we, every time we call a function, we're pushing uh, the stuff for that function onto the stack. And most important aspect of this for our purposes today the return address right next to where we have local variables. And we will be taking advantage of that fact. Other questions? Yeah, Kristen. Um, this is universal for all x86. Yes. Yeah, this is, these addresses are specific to Linux programs running on, on x86. Oh. Are there even zeros in stack address? Can there like last things in the code? Uh, so there are a bunch of leading zeros in the code. I just left them out. Um, the, uh, the stack address has leading zeros because even though our machine is 64 bits, we only actually use 48 bits for the memory addresses in current systems. They just don't need 
uh, all 64 bits. Uh, and so the, the, these higher uh, eight bits tend to always be, always be zeros because we're not, um, uh, not using all 64. It's higher, high as 16 bits. Uh, memory addresses uh, on modern 64-bit systems uh, are 40, uh, use 48 bits of the 64, uh, and that is sufficient for kind of any amount of, of memory current systems have. Other questions? All right, so the name of the game today is Spelling Challenged. <laughs> Buffer Overflow Attacks. So let's define a few things. First, what is a buffer? Uh, it's an array we're using to store temporary data. So uh, you've probably heard the term of a video buffering on, on YouTube or something like that. And it's simply filling up an array with the data for the video so that it can then play it. So, uh, uh, buffers are very often used to store input, like we're getting text input from the user or some sort of data over uh, the internet or, or something like that. We're often going to have arrays that kind of store whatever data we're currently taking in. We do something with it and then we're done. So it's temporary data uh, in that sense. And so buffers are, are these arrays. So what is the overflow piece? So let's consider we have uh, something on the stack like this, and we, at the top of the, the, our, our stack uh, frame for, for the current function, uh, we have Return address 40ddbf, some spot in our code that we're going to return to once the current function is done. And since uh, we're in little Indian, uh, we have bf db4000, and some more bytes of, of zeros up above this to fill out all eight bytes of our, our memory address. And then let's say uh, we're getting some, some user input. Uh, And we've declared an array of characters, buff, which only room for eight characters. So we have uh, buff, the, the first character of buff here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So index 0 through 7 on the stack here, right next to our, our return address. So let's say that we get some input from the user, and they give us a nice string birds. Great string. So we put b, i, r, d, s, Null terminator on the stack. Life is good. Fits nicely in our array. 
But C does not do any bounds checking on our arrays. Our arrays are just a pointer to the spot in memory where it starts, and we can write to any part of the stack that we want using that pointer. So let's say instead of birds, birds are cool. Even better. So we still have birds, but instead of an alternative there is a space, A, R, E, space, C, O, continuing on from there. And so when we took in this input, wrote it to the start of our array, we just blasted right over our return address and just wrote bytes of our string uh, instead of the return address. And when we get to uh, our RET, our return instruction, what's, what's going to happen? What does RET do? Oh. It's going to pop O, what was it? O, C, space C. Or O, C, space E in the stack, and then whatever the pass E, like whatever pass E, that's in the Exactly. It's going to pop whatever bytes are here into our instruction pointer. Be like, well, that's the address of the next instruction we're executing. Who knows if something there is a legal instruction if we're allowed to access that memory. Uh, but at any rate, our function is going to do something it's not supposed to. So this is the basic idea of a buffer overflow. We have some array on the stack. We overflow it, we write past the end, and as a consequence, we overwrite some other important data that's on the stack. Jay. So the way to avoid an overflow is just by making your array size bigger when you find a buff? So uh, there are various kind of strategies we might use to avoid this issue. Um, one would, yes, be making our buffer a lot bigger. Um, another would be, getting the input in such a way that actually limits how many characters of input we're going to, we're going to read. Uh, so this was in particular a problem because we had nothing checking that we only wanted to get at most eight characters of input. We just got however much input there was and slapped it onto the stack. Other questions? All right. So let's look at an example. So here's a, uh, a function. Uh, this get char uh, function just gets one character of input from the terminal, from standard in. So I'd like you to discuss with your neighbors uh, what could go wrong with this gets function. Like what are, what are potential problems uh, or issues that that you think there might be. So take a couple minutes to discuss with the, the folks around you. All right, what what's uh, what's a potential issue that might exist in this this gets function? Someone I haven't heard from today want to volunteer on that. Chris? Um, I believe the issue here is that we're passing in this destination string and uh, that's being initialized before we actually get all the characters. So our destination string already, already has a fixed size, but the gets function doesn't care about the size of the destination string. It'll just write for how many characters there is from the file that we're reading. Exactly. That we get has no information about how much memory the destination has, uh, and it doesn't. And, and so we'll just exactly write as many characters as it as it has in in input. And this, it's, sorry. It's phrased even. Uh, so our uh, we we don't know in this case. This destination pointer could be anywhere in memory, but uh, wherever it is, we could blow past the end of our of our string. Uh, this gets function is actually a real C library function. 
uh, and we can look at documentation about it using the man, short for manual command on Linux, and get a string from input deprecated description. Never use this function. This function is, is, is so, so very bad. Uh, and this explains why, what we were just talking about, we just don't know how much it's gonna read, so we can't anticipate and allocate enough memory for it to, uh, uh, for it to safely read uh, that input, um, use of inherently dangerous function, and uh, this even uh, tells you use f gets instead. This other this other function, uh, we can take a look at f gets, and we see that it takes in a size. So f gets is read this many at most this many characters from in input, and that that makes it so much safer. We're no longer in danger of just reading uh, ten billion characters. We can actually tell it how many to read. Uh, it's even the case that if we try and compile C code that uses the gets function, GCC warns us the gets function is dangerous and should not be used. <laughs> Why it? That's an interesting question. Why does this function still exist in the C library? Yeah, Shake. Uh, uh, doesn't C try to be like backwards compatible even if they're like updated? Exactly. We have decades, decades of C code that people have written. And I promise you, gets is used a lot in C code that is undoubtedly still being used today. Which means that we can't actually just turn it off because that would just break a bunch of code that people still need to use. So what we do instead is just plaster warning labels everywhere and hope that, that programmers don't keep repeating the same mistakes. You know, that, that's optimistic, I gotta say. Um, all right, other, other questions on uh, gets? All right, so let's look at a buffer overflow in action. So I have this buff.c has a couple simple functions. There's a main function, calls call echo, call echo, calls echo, and echo does uh, something similar to the example we were just looking at. Has a stack allocated buffer, a string, calls gets, bad idea, and then just prints out whatever string it took in. So it echoes whatever, whatever the input is. So, I can verify that uh, gets works. Hello, prints out hello. No problem. So let's take a look at the assembly and figure out uh, what this actually does. So there's various boilerplate stuff, but here's our echo function. It subtracts 16 bytes from our stack pointer at the beginning of the function, so we are uh, allocating a 16 bytes of space, even though we're only using eight for that string. So the compiler, uh, maybe to keep things aligned to 16 bytes, maybe, uh, to give some extra space, allocate 16 bytes for this stack frame, uh, and we then uh, pass in a, a pointer to um, to our string uh, to to the gets function. Uh, we are we're moving our, our stack pointer plus eight into uh, into RDI. So if I Run this and give it uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 9, 0, 1, 2. Prints that out fine and then has a segmentation fault. Segmentation fault is 
whenever you try and access a memory, whenever a program tries to access a memory address, it's not allowed to touch. The operating system says, no, 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 and just ends the process. And that's, that's what the segmentation poll means. It's, you access a memory you're not allowed to. Um, if I run this with slightly less, oops. Still get uh, a segmentation fault. It's interesting that when I uh, I just recompiled this, and between when I was looking at this earlier, uh, the the buffer has been moved. What is now right next to the return address. Uh, so uh, if we um, just put in uh, eight characters. That works fine. If we put in nine, that's fine. 10, that's fine. So let's actually uh, uh, use GDB, set a breakpoint at echo, run here, and then I can look at what RSP is pointing to at, at this point. Um, and uh, we're seeing some, some sort of a address here. I can say uh, examine uh, what's at that address. Uh, so saying that it can't be accessed, that's probably because we're not seeing the full thing. Show me eight bytes worth. There we go. I can say examine what's there and show it to me as an instruction. And so I can see that it's returning to this instance uh, that the address on the top of the stack, the return address, points to <coughs> this instruction adding it to RSP in, in call echo. If we disassemble call echo, that indeed is the instruction right after the call to the function we're currently in. So our return address, as we expect, points to that, that, uh, that, that function now if we look uh, at our at our current function, we can go one, two, three, four, five instructions forward and look at what's in RDI. More useful to see it as hex. So we have some stack address in RDI that were uh, that were. Um, uh, passing into to gets the start of our, our buffer. And if I look back at what RSP was, it was DAA8 was the, uh, the address of our, where our return address is, and our buffer is 98. So it's just 16 bytes away from our return address, the start of our buffer. So now that we know where things are, can take a look at this kind of stylized spreadsheet uh, example where we have our eight bytes of buffer. Uh, and in fact, in this particular version, we saw that there was an unused eight bytes and then our return address was right after that. And if we then uh, look at, we'll just ignore that row. And if we look at what happens when we put in input, when we put in, say, uh, zero, 
uh, which is hex 30, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Eight, nine. When I put in those digits, there wasn't any problem. There was no segmentation fault uh, because even though we overflowed the buffer, we just overflowed into this unused space here. But as we keep going, zero, one, two, three, four, five. Once we go zero through nine and then zero up to five, then we're going to overwrite the least significant byte of our return address with our null terminator. So that will put zeros there. And let me fill in the correct return address from this example. So we had, this was BD46. Sorry? Yes, thank you for reminding me. Uh, four six five 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 one two three four of these and then four zeros and so at this point we're going to overwrite our least significant byte of the return address with our null terminator so we can try this out here say if we do buff NSP there, one, two, three, four, five. That does that does fine. If we look at the uh, the disassembly, interesting. What did this do? So if we were to examine our uh, new return address, 0, 0, 0, 0, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, and it was uh, 46, 0, 0, we see that it does actually return to just another instruction somewhere in memory. So it didn't crash, but it just like went off and started executing some some code. Did not kind of go back to where where we would have expected it. And let's say that we were to overwrite it with uh, six and then the null terminator. That should cause a segmentation fault because it says we can't access memory. So if we change the return address to here by not stopping at five, but doing six, and then zero, zero, kind of override our return address just enough so that uh, it oh, I meant to run it normally. We were at just enough so that we corrupt the return address and now it tries to return somewhere that it's not allowed to access. Uh, it's also possible that you could uh, overwrite it with a, an, uh, the return address to send the program to like in the middle of two different instructions. So it tries to interpret like a random collection of bytes as an actual instruction and you can see something, it will tell you illegal hardware instruction. If it, ends up returning to memory that it can access, but there's not actually bytes that correspond to a real instruction there. So this is our buffer overflow uh, in action. Um, what are your questions about this? Hayden. So people use this to crash programs only? So that's a fair question. So far, I've only shown that this like causes our program to crash. That's not very exciting. So, uh, but 
or causing it to crash by changing what the return address is. So let's imagine that uh, instead of uh, just overwriting the return address, we do something like this. So here's our stack. Higher addresses going this way, buffer starts here. And our return address is somewhere above the buffer on the stack. So we know if, the, if, we, if we put enough stuff in the buffer, then we can change the return address. What we can also do is, in this example, I was just putting in text 0, 1, 2, 3, just like arbitrary digits. But instead, I could put bytes onto the stack that correspond to actual code. It's like take bytes that are specific instructions and put it onto the stack as part of the input that I'm giving that's filling up the buffer. And then fill up the rest with just arbitrary stuff, and then overwrite a return address with this address. Overwrite the return, return address with the address of our exploit code. So then when this function returns, the next instruction it will execute, because all return does is pop an address off the top of the stack and put that in our instruction pointer, it will cause the next instructions to be executed to be whatever this uh, nefarious actor put onto the stack as part of their employee, export. Uh, and this is called a Code injection attack, a type of buffer overflow attack where not only are we smashing our, our return address, we're also putting code that's just going to let, we're going to hijack the program and cause it to return to code that we injected into memory. What other questions do you have? Do you know the buffer size? Um, how do attackers know the buffer size to start off with? So that's, that's a, uh, a good observation. That we have to know how far away our buffer is from our return address to kind of do this precise arrangement of, of uh, memory and, and the return address. So there are a couple ways this might happen. First, if, uh, as we did, we have access to the assembly. We can just look at that and figure out where the buffer is relative to where the return address is. If we don't have that, but we do have some way to try different inputs, we can just try a bunch of different sizes. Like we know that it's going to be just the stack frame. And the stack frame is probably going to be a multiple eight or sixteen in total size, and we just try a bunch of different ones and figure out what works. Um, so that those would be either you would be able to to play with you would need to like have access to the executable in some way, either be able to look at the assembly or to try various various inputs. Other questions. All right, so let's uh, do a bit of practice, and then we'll talk about uh, how we might uh, deal with these, these attacks. So I have a vulnerable function. Uh, we can see how much 
space it allocates on the on the stack subtract q hex 40 from rsp we can see the the memory address of the buffer it loads into rdi for its call to the unsafe function gets it's rsp plus hex 10 and so we want to change the return address which is uh 405 d1 27f ff cafe food The question is, how many bytes do we need to uh, do we need to input? Does gets need to read and put into the buffer in order to uh, make that change to the return address? All right. Please discuss with your neighbors how you're thinking about counting what bytes we need to write. And we've. Uh, had some some movement in the in the right direction. So uh, can can someone explain how you how you thought about uh, this particular overflow? Eric. Um, well, I knew it was going to be fifty because we're subtracting forty and then moving like ten up. So that's a fifty difference. Um, and between the one and the four, there's a four byte difference between the original return address and the one we're changing it to in terms of the one we're changing it to starts four bytes more to the left. I'm not sure exactly what that means. That's why we're not going to Yeah, so we subtract hex 40 at the start. That's our that's setting up the stack frame for the current the current function, the return address and which we pushed on, and then the 40 hex 40 that we, we allocated. Uh, so how many how many bytes is hex 40? Yeah, so this is 64 bytes total. And then our LEA instruction takes RSP and adds 10 to it. That's 10 up, which we go down to grow the stack, 10 uh, goes, goes back. So our buffer here is hex 30 or 48 bytes below our return address. And so we have to overwrite these 30 or 48 in decimal, and then we have six of the eight bytes of our return address need to change. These higher order ones can stay zero, but the lower six need to change. So 48 plus six is how I get to, to 54 total. Oh. Uh, yes, that's, that's uh, uh, a fair point that we do. Uh, this is assuming the system is, is little Indian, which any x86 system will, will be. Other questions? Eric. Uh, so hex 40, we have 0 in the 1's place, 4 in the 16's place. So 4 times 16 is, um, is 64 when I, I turn it. Krista? Um, with the 6 plus 40, I go with the 6. So 48 from uh, our stack frame plus hex 10. And then the 6, I observed that out of the 8 bytes of our return address, we need to change 6 of them. So two of them can stay zero, but we want to overwrite these six with <coughs> these new six bytes. And as Owen pointed out, this is going to be in little endian. So the first byte of the return address will be its least significant byte. And it will be stored from least significant to most significant. So 
kind of the first byte of the return address we overwrite will be that D1, then 0, 5, then uh, 40, and so we'll overwrite those six, and then we'll have, have changed it into in the what we want. Does that make sense? Yeah. John? Why is it 64 bytes and not bits? Uh, because uh, memory address uh, memory is byte addressed. So each memory address refers to a particular byte. And so if we uh, subtract something from, from RSP, we're removing the memory address that many bytes. It's every, yeah, the, we, we, our memory addresses don't refer to, to individual bits to there to these 8-bit eight bit, eight bit chunks. Other questions, Sean? If 48 was like an option on uh, one of the four, that would have been the next service. Uh, so 48 would have overwritten the part of the stack, but none of the return address. The return address starts 48 bytes away from our buffer. So we can fill up. I mean, we don't know how big this buffer is, whether it's all 48 or only part of it, and there's other stuff here. But to get from the start of our buffer to the start of the return address is 48, and then we need additional bytes to start to overwrite the return address. That makes sense? Other questions? All right, so. Some interesting real-world examples of uh, our buffer overflow. Uh, there was, um, so they're, they're incredibly common. Like this buffer overflow uh, thing with user input used to be the number one technical security vulnerability. Uh, I say technical because the number one security vulnerability is always people, like through, um, uh, uh, ignorance or bad practices or whatever it is, or social engineering, so someone uh, sends you a phishing email, like people are always the number one, number one weakness. I have a, 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 a friend who, who works for, who, who works on the cloud security team at Google, and apparently Google has an internal team that kind of mounts security uh, attacks on their stuff to, to make sure everything is, is protected, and uh, at one point, Google said to this internal team, like, look, you can stop with the, like, phishing emails, the social engineering attacks. We know those are just going to work, so you don't need to, you don't need to keep testing those. Well, we're just going to design the system differently so that those are, are less of a vulnerability. Um, so one of the, the famous examples is from 1988, uh, the Internet Worm. Uh, this was, there was a uh, protocol for getting uh, the status of some computer on the internet, a server, uh, and it used our, our gets function, our, our uh, hilariously unsafe gets function, uh, to read the argument for the kind of name of the, the server you were, you were checking. Uh, and so uh, uh, there was a... Uh, this, this worm, this exploit, uh, sent exploit code to some computer on the internet uh, that then executed what is called a root shell on, on that computer, which just means a terminal with uh, unlimited administrator privileges. So uh, basically sent uh, an internet request to some, some computer, that computer read in that input without checking how much input it was reading, and this allowed you to send malicious data that then would take over the computer and actually would then have that computer send more of these requests to others. Um, this invaded about 6,000 computers in a matter of hours. Uh, this may not sound like a lot. There's probably 6,000 computers on Carlton campus, but at the time, this was 10% of the entire internet. Um, the, the author of this worm, Robert Morris, was the first person ever convicted under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. He is now a faculty at MIT, so <laughs> it seems to have worked out all right for him. I think he did this as a graduate student at Cornell. Uh, took down a big chunk of, of 1988 internet. Um, a more recent example uh, is something called the Heartbleed Bug. 
um, which eventually the screen will, will catch up and, and show. Um, don't know why the Wi-Fi has been so sad lately. All right, so uh, basically there was this heartbeat program that you could use to ask a internet connected computer, uh, are you still around? And it did this by saying like, are you still there? Here's, this, here's how many, um, uh, here's a, a, a string in memory you should uh, reply back and here's how long it is. But this heartbeat program did not check that the length of the string it's supposed to reply and the number of characters the user told it to reply with matched. It just did whatever those, those said. So server is still there, reply potato, which is six letters, server replies potato. Server is still there, so reply bird, four letters. And the vulnerability came in, a server is still there, if so reply hat, 500 letters. And so the server would just read 500 bytes of memory and send it back to whoever this request. These 500 bytes of memory might uh, include things like uh, sensitive information, passwords, financial stuff. Uh, so this is a huge vulnerability when, when it was discovered in 2014 and affected Tumblr, Google, Yahoo, uh, Dropbox, Netflix, Facebook, many, many, many sites, uh, uh, and was quite, uh, quite expensive to go through and actually fix uh, 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 this on, on all, the, all the affected machines. In addition to uh, uh, computers, uh, kind of internet, internet servers uh, in 2010, um, well, uh, in 2010, uh, researchers at University of Washington discovered a uh, buffer overflow in car software. And you could wirelessly uh, hack a car and do, um, you know, normal stuff like disable the brakes, unlock the doors, turn the engine on or off, um, because there was a, a potential buffer overflow in, in the software operating on, on board a car. Uh, in 2017, also at University of Washington, security researchers demonstrated that DNA sequencing machines were vulnerable to buffer overflows where if they read a sequence which embedded in it a buffer overflow, this input would cause a buffer overflow in the software running on the DNA sequencing machine. So this stuff is absolutely, absolutely everywhere. Um, if it's everywhere, how do, we, how do we deal with it? So an important aspect of this code injection attack which the heartbleed bug, this is uh, reading contents of memory you're not supposed to have access to, so that's not this code injection, we're not running arbitrary code, but that internet worm, which was like taking over computers, that's this kind of code injection attack. This depends This depends on the stack being executable. Like in order to put code on the stack and then run it, the system has to allow you to execute instructions that are on the stack. And in modern systems, basically, this the stack was always executable pre-64-bit x86. But in the early 2000s, when, when x86-64 uh, uh, was released, the hardware could now uh, allow the operating system to make regions of memory not executable. So in modern systems, the stack is not executable, and this kind of straightforward code injection attack just can't work, because the system will, will end a program if it tries to, we'll get a segmentation fault. We try and execute an instruction that's stored anywhere but the code section, which, uh, as we also talked about, is read only. So that's one protection. Um, another gets at this need to know how far away our buffer is from our return address. So another countermeasure is
stack randomization. So this is just every time we run a program, the stack region is offset by a random arbitrary amount. So this means that we can no longer predict reliably what address something on the stack is going to be at because it's randomized each time. So that makes these sort of attacks much harder uh, uh, because uh, we now have to spend much longer to, to brute force and we have to just get lucky one time that our guess of where things are in the stack lines up with the, the randomness, something like that. Writing better code, very helpful in mitigating security vulnerabilities. Use fgets instead of gets, so you can give it a, a, a size of how many how many bytes. Use um, use stir n copy rather than stir copy, so that we copy only a fixed number of bytes and won't overflow a buffer when copying a string. Or just use some language that's not C. Like, C doesn't, doesn't check buffer bounds at all. Many languages do. So uh, uh, C is, is not the sort of uh, paragon of security, of computer security, as far as languages go. And another strategy is to detect when something bad has happened on the stack. And uh, this goes by the this uses something called a stack canary. And after you, uh, when people would, would mine coal, it would be a canary, a bird that they take with them that was sensitive to more sensitive than people to poisonous gases. So if your canary wasn't doing so hot, you knew that the, the air was bad. Uh, so this borrows that name, a stack canary, which is just we're going to put something on the stack between our local variables and our return address, such that if that canary value has changed, we know that there has been some sort of uh, uh, mischief with, with stack memory. So you may, it went by quickly, uh, but you may have notice that when I compiled uh, the, uh, the vulnerable program, I passed GCC uh, this argument, dash F no stack protector. I was telling GCC turn off this stack protection feature so that I can, I can show you what happens when a, when a buffer overflow occurs. Uh, if we Look at a version of uh, uh, the code that uh, is compiled with the stack protector, and it eventually will uh, will show up. Uh, we'll see a um, uh, a couple uh, instructions have been uh, inserted in that after we allocate the uh, stack frame, we take a value from this percent %fs. This is a uh, operating system protected register that's initialized with some random, random value. So we basically take a random value, put it into RAX, move RAX onto the stack. So we put this random value onto the stack, and then before we return, we move it off the stack and then XOR it against uh, the, the value that it was at the beginning and check that they're equal. And if they're not equal, um, uh, then we would call this stack check fail function. Uh, so if I run this stack protected version uh, of the code, and I attempt to do Uh, if I attempt the same sort of stack overflow, hopefully this will eventually show that a message stack smashing detected pops up because once it detected that this canary value had changed, it, uh, it uh, 
uh, didn't ever get to the return and instead called this like uh, bad thing has happened function. All right, so lab three, yes, there we go. Stack smashing detected and it just ended the program. So uh, that will do it for today. Uh, lab three is about uh, mounting uh, uh, a series of, of buffer overflow attacks on a couple of vulnerable executables. Uh, similar lab two, progress is tracked automatically. There won't be anything to turn in. You just need to uh, successfully go through the exploits. You, uh, so read through the handout, bring any questions uh, on the lab to, to Friday. I have office hours at 4.30 today, and I'll see you on Friday. Thank you. Thanks,